Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitriol Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. Hello, and welcome to the JVRD Authors Forum podcast. On this episode, we will be discussing newly published research on ILM peeling success rates for macular off-retinal detachment, recently featured in the May-June 2023 issue of JVRD. I'm happy to welcome my guest, fellow retin specialist, Dr. Mark Simone. Dr. Simone is an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Alberta, he also serves as the fellowship director for the university. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. So you have hit on a topic of interest to myself and, and many of our ASRS members, which is the effect of macular internal limiting membrane peeling on single surgical success rates of vitrectomy for uncomplicated primary macula off retinal detachment. First, Mark, what made you choose that subset of inclusion criteria? I think this sort of stemmed to, from my fellowship and when I entered into career. So I, I trained here as well at the University of Alberta. And uh, our group uh, is made up of eight different vitreoretinal surgeons. And we routinely peel um, macula off detachments uh, in the setting of that it's uncomplicated. And so specifically talking about in the absence of PVR. Um, the idea is that you increase macular compliance and hopefully you would reduce the rate of redetachment in those individuals. And the other thing, too, is that you reduce, as we all know, epiretinal membrane formation in those individuals, which could lead to improved visual acuity down the road. Um, but, I, you know, in some of these detachments, I would look at them and I would say this detachment, this retina looks very mobile. You know, the, the ILM obviously has a, a function, although we haven't, I don't think, entirely figured out what that is yet is removing it a good thing. And it really, when I looked at some of the OCTs down the road, I didn't know if it really was or not. And so we wanted to delve into that and determine whether, you know, we were truly doing the right thing for these people by peeling the ILM in that subset of retinal detachments. Well, I think for many of us, you know, the, the initial controversy was peeling the ILM in epiretinal membrane or macular hole cases. And, and I think that's, that's really driven most of us to peeling ILM. Um, you're now peeling ILM in a macula off detachment, which has technical challenges that, that move that one step further. So what really pushed you to, to look at the data and how did you have a pool of patients that were either peeled or with the ILM or not peeled with the ILM? Yeah, so we have um, uh, a, an EMR, which, which looks at our data for the, at least since 2016. So this, apply, or this allows us to have a very large data set that we can look at to answer these questions. Because I have these questions, we created a search criteria, and that search criteria allowed us to identify about 194 patients that met our inclusion criteria. Now, there is less of those individuals were appealed than those that weren't, but there was still a significant number in each group that allowed us to analyze the data, I think, to the best of our ability, given a retrospective study. And one of the things when we do retrospective cohort analysis like this is we always worry about some type of inherent bias in the selection. So was there something differing between the group that was peeled for the ILM and the group that was not? So it's possible. I mean, we have eight surgeons, all of whom are making the decision whether to peel or not um, uh, in the patients. Um, then everybody has their own idea as to why they wouldn't or would peel. Now, we tried to limit that bias as much as possible. And the way we did that was taking all complicating factors out of the equation. And so, you know, these people did not have PBR. None of them had additional surgery, such as scleral buckling everybody had C3A gas used as opposed to silicone oil or SF6. And the time to symptoms that we looked at was similar between the two groups. So I suppose a criticism could be, were those individuals 
with Immaculoft attachments, perhaps more complicated or that were peeled more complicated. Um, but given our exclusion criteria and the fact that the time to onset of symptoms was similar between the two groups, I think that we were able to um, to sort of um, reduce that amount of bias in our in our study. Yeah, I mean, without randomizing, you know, that's that that's always what the concern is. And I think for me, my personal bias is I'll peel the ILM in what I think are the worst cases. So I, I bias more toward ILM peeling in an eye in an eye that I'm more worried about. So I would have had some selection bias in in my practice, but that's very different um, at different institutions. So it seems appropriate how you address that. Yeah, we are quite aggressive with membrane peeling, you know, in very complicated detachments. As fellows, we would peel out to the ILM out to the arcades if we could to help flatten the retina. And so, you know, I really wanted to sort of focus on that group that you really ask yourself, do you really need to do it here? And I think that that um, subset of individuals was helpful, that we isolated was helpful to answer that question. There's also a controversy about using ICG versus, you know, Brilliant Blue. Do you think that the dye plays any role in 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 a study like this? It's possible. Um, we routinely use ICG in our peels. We have not noted any cases of true toxicity from the ICG. We don't really leave the ICG in the eye for a very long period of time or enough time for it to be cytotoxic. And also, we dilute the ICG um, in balanced salt, and so, you know, I, I, there, it's possible, but I would doubt that the ICG really played a role here. Yeah, I, I'm still an old school ICG user, but they're certainly transitioning away from that at many at many surgery centers around the country. Did you have any aspect of the study that that you guys were really surprised about? Yeah, I was surprised by two major factors of the study. The first is that I truly believe that if you re remove the ILM in those patients, that you would increase the rate of of uh, anatomic attachment. And there was no difference between the two groups, in spite of a, maybe a small trend towards the peeled group. Um, and you know that sort of made me rethink the way I approach these cases surgically, because initially at the beginning of my practice, I was very aggressive about peeling the ILM and in most macula off retinal detachments. Um, the other thing that really surprised me was the epiretinal membrane development um, and the fact that the, most of the membranes, at least at a year out, were not visually significant in any of the individuals that we looked at. Only four went on to surgery. And that those group, that group, even though they developed an epiretinal membrane, they were also the ones with the better visual acuity at the end. So it just tells me again that you know, you don't always have to to peel, you don't, and you can always sit back and watch. And most of those individuals probably don't need a second surgery down the road. So even if you're peeling ILM to reduce epiretinal membrane formation, it might not always be necessary. But your data did nicely show that if you peeled the ILM, the ERM formation, you know, was essentially zero. Yeah, very true. I mean, with, from 29% to zero. Yeah. So 29% probably on the upper end of of normal for what the literature would support. Um, but we were pretty inclusive of what a membrane was. And so any pre-retinal membrane was included. And so, yeah, it, even though we didn't have any epiretinal membranes, uh, for some reason, the vision in the peeled group actually ended up being worse at one year. How do you, when you look at the, at the peeled group, um, what do you what what do you think is the indication for a worse division? I think probably um, at least when you look at the OCTs and you looked at our, our uh, data looking at um, the thinning of the temporal retina, um, there are structural changes to the OCT after peeling, and perhaps those are visually significant, um, and maybe in some cases more significant than a mild epiretinal membrane, and so perhaps that led to worse vision in that group. Um, I will say that we did account for uh, fakia, so every patient in our study was pseudophagic by the end, so there was not an imbalance of cataract in one group or another that would play a role in that either. So, so it was kind of interesting. So when I read your paper, the take home for me was, it's really going to be my choice whether I peel the ILM or not, and and 
I think that anatomically I'm pushed toward wanting to peel, but visually I'm pushed toward maybe sparing the central foveal component of the peel. Um, but it was reassuring that the success rates in both of these groups were so good for, for your patients over time. Yeah, I, I think similarly, I've reduced the amount that I now peel the internal limiting membrane. Um, I generally have now started saving it for those with PVR grade B or more. Um, and uh, actually, I have not noticed a difference in my results as far as anatomic reattachment goes. Um, it is it is good that we had a, a good success rate and, you know, um, we're happy about that. There are some papers that look at this that had a much higher read attachment rate. And I think that that can play into how you may interpret the results of those papers. Um, but all in all, yeah, it was interesting that there was really no difference in read attachment rate between the two. Well, I'll commend you because I think doing a surgical analysis with a large group of varied surgeons, even within one practice, is challenging. And, and I think you guys did a really, really excellent job. And it's reassuring that the anatomic and visual success rates are so good. So, Mark, thanks for joining us. Thanks for discussing this important study. I think it will generate a lot of readership because this is bread and butter retina for all of us. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate the opportunity to discuss the paper with you. Thank you again. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.